Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of CRE Exchange. I am Cole Perry, your host and senior market analyst at Altus Group, a leading provider of asset and fund intelligence. I am joined by Omar el our U.S. Director of Research. And on this episode, we're excited to have another special guest interview, uh, this time with Ed Pierzik from NAREIT. So Ed is currently Senior Vice President of Research at NAREIT. Uh, his primary responsibility is contributing to NAREIT's uh, CRE and macroeconomic analysis. He also builds relationships with public, private, and academic orgs. So Omar, I'll turn it back to you to give some more background on our guest. Thank you. First of all, Ed, very excited to have you here. Uh, I think we've interacted at a few events, but I've been a longtime fan of your work. Um, and I'm hoping that we can uh, give some of our listeners a, a little bit of background. Um, so I know that after studying industrial engineering as an undergrad and then getting your master's in finance, you really began your career in commercial real estate. What, what drew you to the field of CRE? Yeah, you know, it's actually pretty interesting. Uh, you know, with the story, I, it's not a typical path. But uh, I would describe myself as a capable but not a passionate engineer. And uh, I knew I needed to do something else. So uh, I went over to the business school, uh, ended up being a uh, teaching assistant and research assistant for a couple of professors uh, in the real estate program. And then really with that, uh, it, uh, it made me think I wanted to be a professor. So uh, I stayed on and then I ended up teaching a couple of summer courses that were all my own. But uh, what I quickly realized was one, I was just a few years older than most of the seniors in my class. Uh, they asked a lot of questions that I didn't have answers to. So I'd always be like, I'll get back to you. And, uh, and ultimately real estate's a practice. So uh, I, I really decided that I had to go out and, uh, and get some experience. Uh, initial thought, it would be a few years. Uh, next thing I know, I, I had 20 years in the private equity real estate investment management business. That's fantastic. And so you spent time uh, over a decade at Henderson Global Investors and yep. then at TIAA, both in portfolio management and, and investment strategy roles. But then you made a shift to San Diego State, where you served as the director of the Corky McMillan uh, Center for Real Estate. Can you tell us a bit about that shift um, and what you did at the Macmillan uh, Center? Yeah. So at SDSU, I was a tenure track uh, faculty member in the finance department, but also a director of the real estate center. And, and the real estate center was really kind of the connection for the university out to industry. And uh, so it'd be a connection for uh, professors, the university, but primarily students. So um, you know, I, I really can, I came to a point and I always knew that I wanted to at least try teaching again. And, uh, the opportunity actually presented itself through a former business partner that we had done a lot of investments with both at Henderson and at TIAA and, uh, really thought it'd be a great opportunity. And I'd have to say that, uh, you know, the, the experience with the students was stellar. Uh, you know, it is, it is probably one of the most personally rewarding things that I've done. And, uh, and I, I really love the interaction and, and probably more importantly, and this is one of the things that the center focused on was getting students ready for industry. And so we did things like Excel boot camps and, um, also very involved in, uh, real estate business case competitions, the NAOP challenge. And, uh, and I, you know, I was interested in, in getting a lot of good quality students placed uh, at great firms, uh, both in the California and national market. That's fantastic. It, building the next generation of, of industry leaders. Um, and with your career path, you've gone from a practitioner in the industry to seeing that academic side. And then after SDSU, you went to you joined Nairi that I, I don't think it's, it's common that everybody gets to see those different perspectives. Can you speak a bit to, uh, how, how that variety of experience, uh, really kind of shaped your, your perspective of the industry as a whole? Yeah, no, I think that, you know, so if I look back, like at my time at both Henderson and TIAA, um, you know, I really kind of held three roles, uh, always had a hand in strategy and research. Uh, I was a portfolio manager for a core open-end fund, 
And then lastly, I spend quite a bit of time, uh, you know, visiting clients and consultants both here and overseas. Uh, and whether we're talking about a house view or, or, or pitching a fund and, you know, and I think just within all those that there's really been some great learning uh, opportunities. Uh, number one is a researcher, you know, that you get a result. Uh, often it's a very specific result. Uh, but what you quickly realize is that result may not be uh, efficient uh, in a real estate strategy. And so, uh, you know, you, you had to kind of operate a little bit more, uh, you know, not with crisp lines, but maybe fuzzy lines. And, uh, and then ultimately as a PM, I was actually forced to eat my own cooking. Uh, so what you realize is you really appreciate that as you do your research, you know, you have to have flexibility uh, and, it, and it has to be a very uh, practical strategy that has some scale. You know, and then, you know, also when I, I spent time meeting with folks, um, you know, it, it was just a great chance to kind of hear the other side. You know, here we are, we're trying to cater to clients, but yet, you know, they, they tell you what they want. And uh, so it was a great time to kind of, you know, you know, step into their shoes. And, and I think one of the most important things of those meetings ultimately is that uh, listening. Uh, if you listen, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you almost everything. And so, you know, those were all great opportunities and uh, experiences. Uh, hop hopping over to academia, you know, I think that what that really helped me with is kind of getting in touch with uh, younger generations. Uh, I, I'd be the first to say that uh, the academic experience is very different today than it was uh, when I went through. And uh, I think students expect a lot more and, and they should. I mean, they're, they're paying a tremendous amount of money uh, to go to school. So, uh, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of lessons learned there. And then ultimately, uh, when uh, the opportunity came up at Nary, uh, I was really quite excited about it. You know, I'm in a research and investor outreach role. Uh, so we continue to do the research, but also uh, meet with clients and consultants. Uh, and then, um, but I, I think most importantly, it was an opportunity to expand my horizons. I had only worked in uh, the private real estate arena up till that point, a little bit in academia. And, and this really lets me get deep involved in public markets. That's fantastic. And I can absolutely see how being a practitioner, being an academic would prepare you very well for your current role at NARIT. But do you think if do you think it would have been possible uh, to do it any other way, uh, whether it's starting as an academic going into the industry or uh, going from uh, an industry group into academia and then into the industry or as a practitioner? You know, it, it's kind of a good question. And I think that I never gave it a lot of thought as to the path. It was just as opportunities uh, uh, came up, it, it, it was, uh, oh, this is interesting. And 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 typically I, I've had a little bit of a motto that uh, always looking for uh, interesting and meaningful work. And then, uh, you know, if you find it, uh, you pursue it a bit. But, uh, you know, the one thing I'd say is kind of um, on the uh, academic side, um, you know, maybe, you know, I, I could have pushed that till a little later in life. Certainly, uh, you know, not, not today, but, uh, you know, maybe at, at some point on the horizon that, uh, you know, I may revisit that. And I, I really have to empathize with you a little bit. I actually started off in engineering and made my way into a CRE as well. So I love, love hearing about your background and, and the path you've taken there. But, uh, you know, we brought you here to, to kind of talk about REITs. And I think for the benefit of our listeners, we'll, we'll start really uh, general and then get fairly specific. So um, what is a REIT and how would they differ from uh, other real estate investment vehicles? And then we'll kind of go through from there. Sure. So uh, REIT is a real estate investment trust uh, created in uh, 1960. Uh, and actually, the idea was to, to give investors access to real estate. Uh, traditionally, real estate was really the realm of institutional investors or uh, wealthy individuals, and, and REITs really gave a chance uh, for smaller investors to participate. Um, but, but REITs own real estate, or, uh, or they uh, make or, or own mortgages. Ultimately, they, uh, their primary income is either rents or interest payments. 
And, um, and so like, uh, as you, you kind of go down the path a little bit, uh, what you'll find is that REITs really didn't start to flourish, uh, probably until like, I call it the early to mid 1990s. And, and there's a little bit of a, a kind of a time factor in there. So, you know, you start off they're they're established in 1960. Uh, then in 86, uh, they were allowed to operate and manage real estate. So that made a big change. They weren't just owners. Uh, in 92 was the uh, upreach structure, uh, which really uh, offered a chance for a lot of growth. And, and it was basically a, a vehicle that, that allowed a lot of uh, investors, private investors, uh, to uh, contribute their uh, properties into REITs. Uh, in a tax advantaged way. And I think one of the, the nice things about that structure is that ultimately uh, it's great for estate planning purposes because there is a step up in basis to your heirs uh, if everything's still left in there. And then, and then but REITs uh, then continued to grow. Uh, you, you saw the, uh, the first REIT, I think it was in uh, 2001, uh, enter the S&P 500, uh, equity office properties, since that time, we have like 29 REITs, maybe uh, probably about two and a half percent or so of uh, uh, the equity uh, market cap. And then also, uh, as, as more time passed, ultimately, we saw real estate become its own uh, gig. And uh, so separated out from uh, uh, the uh, financial uh, sector. And, and so there, there's been a lot of change there. But I, I think with the growth of REITs, what we found is that there's been a lot of innovation. Um, oftentimes when people uh, think about real estate, uh, they immediately think about the four traditional property types. Uh, but yet when you take a look at REITs today, uh, 14 total sectors, uh, 13 are in equity, and then, uh, then you have mortgage REITs as well. Uh, so uh, there, there, there's been a lot of... Uh, uh, change over time. And, uh, and I think with that, it's, uh, presented a lot of investment opportunity. Excellent. I know you talk about that era of the nineties, really the, uh, the birth of the modern REIT era and, uh, and all that growth. Uh, do you think you can give us some stats to kind of how big the REIT industry is today? I know you already put a couple of numbers to it, but, but what does it look like now? Yeah. So, you know, I think overall, if you looked at a, a gross asset value, uh, you're probably at about four trillion. Uh, if you look at public equity REITs, uh, their gross asset value is maybe at about uh, two and a half trillion. And then lastly, if you look at the equity market cap uh, of those REITs, then it probably goes down to about 1.4 billion. So uh, very sizable and very diverse across uh, property types or sectors. Excellent. And so your organization, you know, your primary focus is REITs. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about why or when NAREIT was created and, and why? Yeah. So NAREIT actually uh, was created in 1960. So as REITs came onto the scene, so did NAREIT. Uh, NAREIT is the worldwide voice uh, for REITs with an interest in U.S. real estate. And, uh, and really, we end up doing quite a few different things. You know, we really have kind of a, a, a policy and public affairs group really focusing on uh, advocacy at both the federal and state levels. Uh, we have the research and investor outreach groups, which, again, uh, not only are we publishing our own research, but uh, we're sponsoring research, we're, we're uh, curating research as well. Uh, and then, uh, you know, when we meet with investors, those could be institutional investors, uh, it could be for defined benefit plans and, and even financial advisors. Um, you know, in addition to that, we have a lot of meetings and uh, we, we have really kind of our, our major meeting of the year, great week coming up in New York and uh, really just a great opportunity uh, for anyone, uh, whether you're involved in REITs to today or we're wanting to learn more about them. Uh, to uh, to really get a good chance. Now, it's a little bit different from your traditional conferences uh, where there's a lot of meetings going on behind the scenes, but but every company pretty much gives a 30-minute presentation. So if you have an interest in a specific company or a specific sector, uh, really an opportunity to, uh, to learn quite a bit. And then also we're involved in indices. So uh, we've uh, partnered with FTSE, 
and then also FTSE and EPRA uh, to do both U.S. and global indices. Great. I think a nice overview of uh, NARIT's objective. You, know, you guys do serve REITs, but I guess you're sh you've probably shifted priorities through time. And so I, could you give us a bit of an overview about some of the topics or biggest issues for NARIT and, uh, and its membership? Yeah. You know, so when, when we think about things, um, you know, like our research agenda, uh, we, we, we let it kind of, you know, come to us. It's almost a bit organic. Uh, so we are looking at questions that are out there in uh, industry, uh, you know, things we hear at conferences. Uh, we're also listening to the questions we get not only from our membership, uh, but from investors. And, uh, and so today we hear a lot about divergence. Uh, that's a hot topic. Uh, you know, everyone's worried about interest rates uh, and also with kind of Fed tightening cycles. So we've explored what happens both during and when those uh, tightening cycles end. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about completion portfolios because, you know, one of the major uh, things, or at least our, our kind of point of view stems from that, you know, it is not a private or public real estate question, you know, and, and really it is public and private real estate that they should work together. Uh, and in fact, REITs could be a great complement uh, to an existing private real estate portfolio. So, so we take that view and I think that, you know, it's interesting that, especially when we talk to investors and, you know, kind of reflecting back, uh, a little bit on my, uh, time in academia. And, you know, one of the things, per particularly if you're, you're teaching a introductory, uh, real estate course, uh, whether it's at the undergrad or graduate level, uh, you talk about the four quadrants of real estate. And, uh, but yet in practice, when you talk to a lot of investors, real estate means private real estate. So, so really, uh, you know, when we are out there meeting with folks, uh, we are really promoting REITs, but also saying that, Hey, there, there's a lot of great opportunities, whether it be a, a, a tactical or a strategic investment opportunity. Uh, and, uh, but it's, uh, but it's something that, uh, you have to be ready to, you know, kind of act on. I think that's excellent. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I, I love the, com you know, I, I think you call that completion portfolio. Uh, I love that concept because the topic of public versus private, right? Well, one, it's, I would say it's kind of known as public versus private and that pits them against each other, um, yeah. which I think is, and, and that I'm kind of get tired of that debate, right? Because everybody pulls out the same, uh, you know, I haven't really seen that debate evolve over the years. Um, and it kind of gets nowhere, but how, how are, how are those conversations going? If, if I'm allowed to ask, are you, do you think that, uh, we are getting to a point where, uh, I'll just say broadly capital and capital allocators are starting to, uh, look at real estate as the investment decision, not necessarily public versus private or taking that, uh, two by two, uh, box as, yep. uh, opposing quadrants. Yeah, you know, so I, I think, uh, you know, REITs re have, you know, made a tremendous amount of headway. So if you look at, you know, kind of individual investors, uh, uh, about 170 million Americans live in households today that own REITs. Uh, and then when you uh, take a look at uh, some of the institutional investors, uh, you know, through a variety of metrics, you kind of come up with the same number. But uh, among the largest investors in the States, uh, 65% of them have a read allocation. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, you know, we talked to a lot of folks and some don't do any rates. Uh, some can do rates, but don't some can do rates and do. Uh, so, uh, so we really spend a lot of time talking about opportunities, but also, uh, through time, we've cultivated quite a few case studies, which shows ways that people have said, Hey, look, we looked at our portfolio and we decided to uh, do a completion portfolio. It, you see really kind of, you know, dramatic changes in diversification. Uh, we've had groups that have uh, looked at the current divergence uh, between the public and private markets and said this is an opportunity uh, and invested in it. Uh, we have a case study that we share a lot. And in fact, a little bit of a, um, you know, kind of a, uh, you know, kind of hint of things to come. Uh, upcoming article in the Priya Quarterly 
uh, is written by a group who who did just that. And uh, the the article is, uh, I think, a great article because it really goes through their whole process of not only identifying the opportunity, stepping through the administration internally that they had with the plan, making the investments, harvesting the investments, and then actually sharing an end result. So it, it's almost like a little bit of a recipe to say that if you, you, you want to do some tactical investments, this may be a way out. That's fantastic. Do you think that we'll be seeing a wave of, uh, I would say, the big pools of capital that are a little bit more rigid? Are they going to be updating their uh, IPSs or their investment policy statements to be a little bit more inclusive? Well, we hope so, you know, and, and that, that's certainly what we're trying to do. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the way I look at it is, uh, you know, when, when some of these opportunities arise, uh, if you're not participating really across all the quadrants, it, it's a missed opportunity. And, and then uh, also, you know, to the extent uh, you don't have an allocation, it's effectively a, a bet against something. And, and, and that may not be uh, necessarily what someone wants. That makes sense. And so shifting to the research that you are that you currently do, can you share with the listeners a little bit about, you know, what you're looking at? You're not you're not doing sell side kind of uh, buy, sell, hold decisions on any single entity. Um, what are some of the metrics you're looking at? And ultimately, um, I would say questions that you're trying to answer. Yeah. So, you know, I think that, you know, overall, we're, we're looking at you know, we're, we're interested in the real estate market. We're interested in the private market. We're interested in the public market. And, uh, and overall, we're, we look at the same stuff that everyone looks at. And uh, so, uh, you know, there, there's your traditional tools out there, kind of the, the co-stars and, and all that sort of stuff. But uh, we have some as well that we've developed in-house and we call it our T-Tracker. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's free. We're uh, currently in the middle of preparing the first quarter of, uh, of this year. And, you know, we have a little bit of a delay there because we have to wait for earnings to come out in order to populate everything. But typically once they're done, uh, we'll, we'll have it up within, I'd say about four business days. So probably about mid May we'll release that, but, uh, it's just a wealth of information focusing on, uh, REIT operating metrics. So you could look at things like, uh, FFO, NOI, same store NOI, occupancy rates, uh, dividends, also uh, takes a look at REIT balance sheets, and uh, we, we can look at leverage ratios, uh, weighted average term to maturity, weighted average cost of debt, uh, how much fixed rate debt, how much unsecured debt. And, uh, and, and so it, it's really just kind of another piece. So even as we go out, we talk to folks, and, uh, and, and if they're not interested in REITs, uh, we say, well, look, we have some information that you might like to look at because uh, this this really can help give some additional insight into the broader real estate market. Yep, very uh, from experience, and I've been a consumer of the T Tracker for many years. Huge fan. If people aren't aware of this, uh, it is an incredibly valuable resource. So I thank you and your team for for making that available. Um, shifting to a little bit more around the. Uh, what you're currently seeing? What are what are some of the trends that you think are really affecting REITs broadly today? So you know, if we take a look at REITs and maybe even just kind of stepping through some of the T tracker materials, um, you know, what what we see operationally, I think things are generally still solid. You know, particularly as we look at year over year changes, but but certainly, you know, when you go quarter to quarter. Uh, you start to see some cracks. So, uh, you know, we see some negative rates change. Now, quarter to quarter, it's not always ideal because sometimes there's some seasonality in the data. Uh, but overall, what we see is that we're, we're still seeing uh, generally uh, positive rates of growth, FFO, same store NOI. But if you start to look at the trending on that through time, uh, it's been, uh, it, you know, moderating or tempering. And uh, al although the numbers look good, and, and I would say, you know, you could argue that REITs have kept pace with inflation, uh, we, we see this fall off. But when, when you kind of dig into the fundamentals, you know, the, the real demand and supply out there, and you, you kind of see some of the weakness there, uh, there, there really should be no surprise uh, in this. Um, you know, and, and then also in terms of, 
you know, balance sheets have gotten critically important. We were really have had this, you know, had a surge in the 10-year treasury yield uh, in uh, 2022. And, uh, and if you're refinancing, it, it was a real tough time. Uh, not only did the rate increase, but a lot of other expenses often related to um, variable rate did as well, like any sort of interest rate cap or, and, and things like that. Uh, but, you know, what we see overall is that REITs, I think, learned some lessons uh, from the GFC and, uh, you know, leverage ratio uh, as of the end of uh, fourth quarter uh, was about 33 percent. So, you know, I, I would argue that that's maybe kind of akin to, a, you know, a, a private, maybe core, core plus strategy. Uh, but when we take a look at the uh, uh, really kind of the, the length of the debt or the weighted average term to maturity, uh, over six years, and uh, the cost of that debt uh, had increased with the rise in rates, but still relatively low, at about four point one percent. But uh, but I think the composition of the debt is really pretty telling. And uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, you have REITs are, are big users of uh, fixed rate debt. Uh, on average, over ninety percent of uh, total debt is fixed rate, and I think that's very much consistent with their their long term investment strategies. Uh, but the, the other piece is unsecured debt. So this is debt at the corporate level, and uh, we see that REITs are almost at about eighty percent there. And I, I think that this is you know probably a, a competitive advantage for REITs in the sense that you know they have the ability to access the the, the debt markets. Uh, even in 2022, when uh, rates were, were going up, uh, they still had the ability to access the market. So the kitchen wasn't closed. Uh, but, uh, but ultimately, you know, we think that this, in addition to the ability to, uh, to raise equity, uh, you know, puts them in a real good spot in terms of maybe future acquisitions growth. And wearing your, whether it's uh, your PM hat, your researcher hat, your academic hat, um, and just using all of your experience, how, how do you read the current environment? I know that you just did an excellent breakdown of uh, kind of the income statement as well as the, the balance sheet of, of the REITs in aggregate. But how do you interpret uh, what's, what's happening, whether it's in rates, whether it's in uh, migration, uh, just kind of like that macro environment? Uh, do you have a perspective on, uh, you know, are we... Uh, Everybody likes using uh, what inning we're in, or uh, I was yeah. hearing a lot of survive till 25, right? Uh, but both of those are pretty, uh, this can be negative. Do you have any perspective on kind of like uh, adding some color to how, how you're interpreting the, the broader environment? Yeah, you know, so when we really kind of take a look at things, I mean, the, the few of the kind of lenses we can use is really kind of one, this divergence. Uh, concept. And, and another one could be, you know, what happens uh, both to real estate and REITs after a tightening cycle ends. But, you know, the, the divergence really is, you know, you look through time and there's instances where valuations between public and private markets uh, diverge, right? They, they, they split. And, and at these times, REITs tend to underperform and underperform fairly significantly. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, no one likes underperformance, but oftentimes these are a, perhaps a bit of a signal or a harbinger of a pop in performance. And uh, so, you know, we, we really saw the last major and actually, in fact, most significant divergence uh, was in the third quarter of 2022. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we would anticipate that we would have a little bit of a, a pop there. But in fact, we see that you know, it, it's been kind of a, a, a longer dragged out, you know, I guess, kind of recovery, so to speak. And, and, it's, and that's actually interesting because uh, the next most severe divergence would have been back at the GFC, and that corrected itself at about four quarters. Uh, so we're extended a little bit, but, you know, when we take a look at, uh, you know, the, the Fed tightening policy, that effectively ended um, in the uh, third quarter of last year. Uh, fourth quarter, we, we saw the pop in rates and then, uh, there was a lot of promises that, you know, the year began, but then suddenly, uh, the, the talk, uh, you know, talked about, uh, delayed potential cuts 
And then uh, further, we've had some indications that, uh, you know, some members of the Fed also might think that there may be fewer cuts. Uh, and uh, so when we take a look at really kind of re-performance dating from the beginning of 2022 to now, uh, and uh, you can really map out kind of an interesting relationship with the 10-year treasury yield. And effectively, uh, through the, you know, kind of the lion's share of that time, you, you saw a, a huge increase in the yield. Uh, with that, you saw uh, negative performance for REITs. Uh, but then as we saw a decrease in the yield, we saw the pop in performance in REITs. And then now as we've seen the increase in the yield again, it's kind of gone back to that negative performance. And, and so as, as we kind of look out, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, we would say is that, you know, this kind of uh, recovery for REITs doesn't necessarily have to be linear. So we're, we're not drawing a you know, straight upward sloping line. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it can move around a bit. But the, the one thing that makes us believe uh, that there, there's still kind of fuel in the tank, so to speak, uh, is that when we look at the, the delta of cap rates uh, between the public and private markets, it's still a pretty wide gap. And uh, it probably sits at about 120 basis points. So, so we do think that there is going to be some uh, outperformance for REITs uh, really in 2024. So, Ed, you've already co I covered this from a couple different angles, but I, I really enjoyed your, your piece, uh, you know, published through Mary's website about... Uh, why you think that REITs are poised to be fairly resilient despite these delayed rate cuts. And you talk a little bit about debt trends and the favorable maturity schedule and such, but are there any other reasons you think that might be? Uh, well, you know, I, I think that, you know, re REITs are, are really well positioned. I, I think with uh, uh, a lot of instances, not only do they have a lot of scale, uh, but, uh, you know, they, they are, uh, you know, typically best in class operators. Uh, within their segment, and uh, and you know they're they're in great shape. I I know that uh, you know right now there's still a pretty pretty wide bid ask spread, but uh, as uh, opportunities arise, REITs are are certainly in a great position to uh, you know to to access them. Great, and uh, you know I know we're in the midst of those uh, Q1 earnings calls, and so I know you're waiting to, to get through them so that you can populate all the data in the T tracker. And I know Omar and I are patiently awaiting that too. But uh, they're not all over St uh, this week. There's quite a few calls, yep. um, and I know that you don't follow individual REITs, but you do follow the sector. What are some things you're looking out for? Maybe uh, themes from those calls or or things that you're looking for for the next few weeks. Yeah, so you know, with T Tracker, you're right. We're, we uh, just ran. We're at about fifty percent today. You know, so uh, so we're about halfway. We still got a, a long way to go. Uh, and as you mentioned, we 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 don't really comment on individual securities. Uh, but you know, when and and even on the sectors, uh, you know, oftentimes we're we're hesitant to uh, to do that. But but we we have kind of developed a tool that we've been utilizing really for the last few quarters. And uh, it's our active manager tracker. And effectively, it looks at 27 um, active REIT investors. So these are active managers. And, and they really do provide some kind of interesting insights because from this, uh, you could kind of see what, uh, you know, the managers are thinking. Uh, and then so on, on the one hand, uh, you see where they're uh, potentially overweight. Uh, a particular sector, but then also underweight uh, a sector. And then we can even track the, the changes in a sector quarter to quarter and year to year. So you could kind of see uh, it's, a, it's a little bit backward looking. Uh, so it's, it's maybe not exactly what's happening today, uh, but, but definitely a great place to, uh, to kind of take a look and, and see where uh, uh, you know, active managers are, are placing their bets. And you, you talk a little bit about those managers, but I, I know you have some conversations with investors, other, other industry stakeholders. Um, if you could speak to some general things they might be looking for, as opposed to you guys internally, what, what do you think is the big thing that they're looking for in quarter one's earnings? Oh, so, so I, I think that everyone is, um, you know, as, as we kind of lay out, I guess, kind of the case for REITs, um, you know, they, they're, they're interested, you know, and, and he's a, even as we lay this out, I, I think oftentimes, uh, the, the, the question is uh, whether or not uh, 
you know, they, they can maybe execute a strategy in a timely fashion. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think, again, you know, the, the thoughts are, are, are fairly consistent with what we see on the broad data that uh, we, we still see, you know, really across real estate, public and private, uh, operations still look pretty good. They're solid, uh, but, but there are some cracks and there is some weakening. Uh, you know, we, we're starting to see a little bit of that maybe starting to flow through in some occupancy rates as well. Uh, but, uh, but also, uh, you know, I think that there's a, you know, kind of an overview that, uh, you know, there, there is opportunity on, on both sides and, uh, uh, investors are, are, are really kind of waiting to, uh, to kind of see, uh, the, the right pricing, so to speak, for those opportunities. And are there, looking forward, I guess, are there any emerging trends that you're really honing in on, um, or or if you can elaborate on any of those opportunities that you, you, you mentioned that um, really are catching your attention? You know, I, I think that, uh, you know, just in terms of, uh, you know, kind of emerging trends, I, you know, I, I, I think that we look a little bit towards, you know, kind of the, uh, the, the path of, of REITs. And, and so, you know, we, we view that there's still going to be quite a bit of a REIT growth. Uh, I think that there's, there's going to, be uh, still quite a bit of innovation. Uh, you know, we, we mentioned with the sectors and, you know, and, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, you, you, you have some right in front of you and you don't realize it's going to become a sector, but, you know, gaming came out uh, effectively triple net uh, play uh, uh, for uh, kind of casinos and entertainment properties uh, as uh, the, uh, the tenants. And, um, you know, and, and that came out in the second quarter of 2023. So, uh, so we're certain that there'll be more there. I, I think that, um, you know, REITs will also continue to grow by acquisition. Uh, I think, uh, if you take a look at a, a lot of the, uh, acquisitions over the last several years, uh, the majority have been REIT to REIT. So again, uh, you know, kind of stressing the importance of, uh, the, uh, scale of the business, uh, and, uh, you know, and kind of having a large presence. Uh, I, you know, there, there's no doubt that prop tech is going to influence a lot, you know, what, what that exactly is going to, uh, you know, entail, you know, that that's kind of unfolding today. Uh, but you know, I, I, I think it's a tremendously exciting time for real estate. Do you see any other, uh, either innovation, whether that's on the structuring side, so it would up REITs come back or is there another, is there any other structuring that you think could, uh, um, kind of boost the the REIT industry as a whole. This similarly how uh, the up REITs did in the past, and or do you see all the growth as being kind of the same players just getting bigger? Well, I think there's the same players. I think ultimately there'll be new players as well, uh, and uh, there's growth there in terms of the uh, the structuring. Uh, you know, it's it's not my expertise, so I can't I can't uh, you know go too deep into that. Uh, but then, uh, but, you know, REITs, REITs overall, even with the, you know, kind of the private REITs, the non-listed REITs, they've, you know, they, they've grown in a big way and uh, attracted a lot of interest. That's fantastic. And so, and then looking on, looking out even further, uh, how, how, do, how do you see the industry changing in, say, the next three to five years? Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, with real estate overall, I mean, I, I, I've been involved for uh, a long time now. And, you know, I think the one thing is, uh, you know, the cyclicality of it. And, uh, you know, there, there's good times and there's bad times. And, uh, you know, and we, we can't, you know, we don't really kind of do forecasts on, on, on too far out on what's on the horizon. But, uh, you know, the, the one thing that you can see, you d just plot the return data, plot occupancy rates. You know the cyclicality is there, so uh, you know, and and I think not everyone has experienced, or uh, you know, bad times. So yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see what the next three to five years hold. So Ed, I think that's a a great jumping off point for some of our final questions here. You know, this is a an interesting time to say the least to to get started out in this industry. So if we have uh, some listeners that are probably pretty early in their careers. Uh, do you have any recommendations for them? Uh, you know, going forward. Yeah, you know, ab absolutely. So for anyone, uh, you know, whether you're a, a student who's graduating or early career, uh, I would say get involved. 
uh, get involved in organizations and, uh, and, and, and more so than just membership. You know, I, I take a look at my time at SDSU and, and the students who really succeeded, they, you know, they were involved in the real estate club. Uh, they were, uh, you know, involved in our NAOP challenge, uh, and also, uh, early on started the networking. And, uh, you know, I, I think that if, if you're starting out, I, I think virtually anyone will take your call and give you 10 minutes to, uh, you know, to either talk about, uh, you know, potential opportunities or, or career path. And, and, and that's one of the things that, uh, I, I've always tried to, you know, make available to, uh, all the students that I've come across. So uh, another great segue into my, my next question here. And so I, you mentioned REIT week is, is coming up, but are there any other resources or events that you'd like to make our listeners aware of that, that would be great to, to know about? Yeah. You know, that on, on, for us, that's really the, the big one on the horizon. So it's uh, it's early June. And again, I think that, uh, you know, if you are a REIT investor, a uh, great place to be, if, uh, you are uh, curious about REITs, great place to learn. And uh, I went to my first one last year. And, uh, and I have to say, you know, uh, they're just like short 30 minute sessions. You get a chance to go in, you learn a little bit about a, a company, a business, their, uh, their management. And, uh, you know, and the beauty is, you know, a little bit more, but also it raises a lot more questions. So, uh, and, uh, and folks are accessible. You know, you can ask those questions. And I, I... <laughs> We're, uh, I guess the listeners who are interested, uh, they can, they can sign up on, on Navery, correct? Or, and maybe we can put a link in the show notes, right? Uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Just, just reach out and, and we'll get you in touch with the right folks. Fantastic. So Ed, we, we have one question that we ask all of our guests and that is, uh, if you could snap your fingers and have a big change come to the industry, uh, what would that be? So, uh, Pretty easy answer. I, I would uh, ask investors to invest more in REITs. Excellent. I, I kind of figured that answer was coming, but uh, you know, Ed, it's been great, uh, great to have you here today. We we want to thank you for joining us and giving us some great insights on NAREIT and your career and uh, the the REIT industry or CRE industry at large. We really appreciate it. Um, but Omar, I think that is all the time we've got today. And I uh, look forward to speaking with you on another episode of CRE Exchange. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.